Hi everyone, this is Sam for Ratings.com and today we're going to talk about how we currently measure soundstage and imaging of headphones. These are the two most commonly used terms when talking about localization and spatial qualities of headphones, but unfortunately there are no clear and universally accepted definitions for them, which makes them quite controversial and difficult to discuss. In this video, we're going to offer our definitions for soundstage and imaging, propose methods for measuring them, and we'll also look at some measurement results. But before going in, let me stress that as far as we know, this is the first attempt at defining and measuring soundstage and imaging for headphones. And as you will see, there are still some things for us left to figure out and improve. So if you have any comments or suggestions, make sure to let us know either in the comments below or via email. Now, I would like to walk you through the process of coming up with our definitions and tests for soundstage and imaging of headphones. At ratings, the gold standard for headphone sound quality is the perfect loudspeaker setup in the perfect room, whatever perfect means. That is, we ultimately want our headphones to have a speaker-like soundstage and to give a sense that the music is happening out in front in the room you're sitting in and not in a vacuum in your head. Based on this framework, we investigated the differences between loudspeakers and headphones in terms of localization and spatial qualities, and there are basically three of them. The first one is room effects. With loudspeakers, music is happening in a room where the sound is affected by reflections off the walls and other surfaces, as opposed to headphones where the music is happening at or in your ears. The second one is the distance and angle of the source. Loudspeakers are positioned out in front and at a 30 degree angle, but headphones are usually at a 90 degree angle and very close to the eardrum. And third is crosstalk. With a stereo loudspeaker setup, some of the sound from the left speaker gets to your right ear and vice versa, because there is no separating barrier between them. But with headphones, the sound of the left driver doesn't get to the right ear due to the shadow created by the head. Well, these are the differences between the localization and spatial properties of a stereo speaker setup and a pair of headphones. But what are the similarities? Well, the similarity is in the audio content, the music there is already information in the audio content about how left or right each instrument should be positioned or how wide each object should be or how far back or up front in the mix they should be placed. And to have a good performance, it is crucial for a stereo speaker setup or a pair of headphones to preserve and reproduce these localization and spatial cues inherent to the audio content accurately. So that's how we divide and define soundstage versus imaging. What we call soundstage are the localization and spatial cues not inherent to the audio content, and headphones have to create them rather than reproduce them. That is room effects, angle distance, and crosstalk. So the better the soundstage of a headphone, the more speaker-like they will sound. Conversely, imaging is localization and spatial cues inherent to the audio content, and loudspeakers and headphones have to reproduce them rather than create them. They determine where, how far and how wide the objects should be in the stereo image. Now, in order to explain our testing methodology, I'm going to get some help from the sound localization article on Wikipedia and go through the items under sound localization by the human auditory system point by point to both briefly define them and to explain how they fit in our tests. The first section is duplex theory, which basically says we localize sound on a lateral plane in two ways. One is by measuring the time difference between sound reaching each ear, also known as ITDs, and the other one is by measuring the amplitude difference of sounds at each ear, also known as IIDs. For example, if I snap my finger near my left ear, the sound gets to my left ear much quicker than my right ear. Not only that, because my head is kinda in the way, it absorbs some of the sound before it reaches my right ear, and therefore it will be quieter. That's how I know the sound is coming from the left side. In a stereo loudspeaker setup, a portion of these cues are inherent to the audio content and therefore fall under the imaging category. But some of these cues are not inherent to the audio content and are created by crosstalk. Those fall under the soundstage category. For the imaging portion, as long as the headphones faithfully create the amplitude and time difference between the left and the right channels of the audio content, they will have perfect lateral localization. That is, the left and right drivers of the headphone should perform identically as not to affect what's already in the music. In the imaging category in our reviews, this is covered by amplitude, 
frequency and phase response mismatch. For amplitude mismatch, we calculate the average difference in amplitude between the left and the right drivers. And for frequency response mismatch, we calculate the standard deviation of one channel's frequency response against the other. For phase mismatch, we calculate the standard error of one channel's phase response against the other, but we have also included a weighing filter based on the phase mismatch audibility paper by Jeff Martin to help our scores match human perception better. But before going on further, here we are in the headphone lab, and let's take a look at a couple of phase mismatch examples. So here we have two graphs. On the left, we have the phase response of the Apple EarPods, and on the right is the sound intone CX05. As you can see, the left and right phase responses are really close to each other throughout the range. And as you can see, the phase mismatch on the CX05 is mostly happening in the bass range and in the mid range. So it's gonna make the bass really weak and also it's gonna make the vocals and lead instruments really weak sounding and as if they're coming from the sides. But the higher frequency stuff in the treble range, they're gonna remain intact and they're gonna be reproduced properly. So the next headphone to the right is the Superlux HD681. I'm showing this example because there is a constant mismatch between the left and right drivers here. But if you look at our phase mismatch audibility threshold, this is not going to be really audible mostly, except for the really high treble stuff. So this is a pretty good phase mismatch response, except for the high treble stuff, which these could be a bit audible. So the next headphone on the right is the Sennheiser Momentum in-ear, which has also been rebranded as the HD1 in-ear. I'm showing you this example because this is a nearly perfect phase matching between the left and right drivers, and this is going to be a really good stereo image. For the soundstage portion, we calculate the amount of correlated crosstalk of a headphone. In a stereo speaker setup, the role of crosstalk is to strengthen the phantom center and to make the stereo image more cohesive. In other words, to remove the hole in the middle of the stereo image, which is a characteristic of headphone soundstage. That's why we only calculate the amount of correlated crosstalk between the left and the right channels. Since uncorrelated crosstalk, which does exist to some amount in open back headphones, doesn't really affect the phantom center and the stereo cohesion. Next up are pinup filtering effect theory and monoroll cues. These two sections describe how the human auditory system uses the shape of the pinup, the outer ear, which is part of the individual's HRTF, for vertical localization as well as front back localization. Since the shape of the pinup is very complex and asymmetrical, both vertically and horizontally, depending on the location of the source, different pinot resonances become active. These resonances add direction-specific patterns into the frequency response of the ear, which is then recognized by the auditory system for up, down, and front back localization. In order to measure the amount of interaction between the pinna and headphones, we devise a test that we call PRTF, short for pinna related transfer function. For this test, we got an extra ear for our dummy head, chop this pinna off, and measure the frequency response of each headphone twice. Once with the intact ear, and once with the ear with the missing pinna. The difference between the two frequency responses is what we call the PRTF of the headphone. To come up with a reference to score our PRTF measurements against, we use the loudspeaker. We positioned the loudspeaker one meter in front of the HMS, and performed frequency response measurements with and without the pinna every 30 degrees. We pick the loudspeaker PRTF at 30 degrees as a reference because that's where loudspeakers are positioned in a stereo setup. But as we go through the responses at different angles here, you can see that they actually show a clear pattern. In the soundstage category in our reviews, this corresponds to PRTF accuracy, size, and distance measurements. The accuracy and size values are standard deviation and amplitude calculations done between 2 kHz and 7 kHz which are mostly responsible for how large and natural the perception of the soundstage is. And PRTF distance looks for the depth of the 10 kHz notch, which is mostly responsible for angle and elevation cues. So here we are back in the headphone lab, and now we're gonna look at some PRTF measurement results. Here on the left, I have the PRTF result of the HD800S, and on the right, the Sennheiser HD700. The dotted line in both graphs is our reference loudspeaker PRTF that we measured one meter away and 30 degrees in front. So on the left, the HD800S follows our reference PRTF really closely, except for this part around six kilohertz. 
but we have really good activation and really high accuracy. In terms of the 10 kilohertz notch, we have a really deep notch here, but it has upshifted in frequency a bit. And we have noticed that when we have an upshift in the frequency of the 10 kilohertz notch, it usually gives an idea or impression of the elevation of the sound source. So this could be partially responsible for the good reputation that the HD800S has for their sound stage. So comparing that to the HD700, we also have really good activation and accuracy in PRTF up to 6 kilohertz, but we don't have as deep 10 kilohertz notch. And that could be partially responsible for why the sound stage of the HD700 is considered to be good, but not as good as the HD800S. So I'm going to keep the HD800S as reference on the left, and on the right, we have the HD600. And as you can see here, we don't have much PRTF accuracy activation and not a big 10 kilohertz notch either. So the HD600, although an open back headphone, don't have a really good sound stage compared to the 700 or the HD800S. The next headphone on the right is the Bose QuietComfort 35 II. We have a good amount of activation here, but not a lot of accuracy in the PRTF response, and we don't have a 10 kilohertz notch either. Our best guess for the unusual and uneven PRTF response of the QSC35 is that maybe some headphones use the pinna to dampen the enclosure of the headphone. And when we remove the pinna for the PRTF test, maybe we get some extra resonances in the enclosure. So either the sound stage of the QC35 is going to be a bit unnatural, or this is actually noise in our test. The next PRTF on the right is for the Apple AirPods. At the moment, we actually don't measure the PRTF for in-ears and earbuds because they don't have any pinna interaction and they basically bypass the pinna. So here we can see that the PRTF of in-ears and earbuds is basically a flat line. The next headphone on the right is the Gradle SR125, and this is an open back on-ear headphone. And as you can see here, we don't have much pinna interaction here either. And this on-ear headphone, like most other on-ear headphones, perform really similarly to in-ears and earbuds. Now on the right side, I'm going to go through the PRTF measurements of the Audio-Technica M70, M50, M40, M30, and M20. And as you can see, there is a big difference between the PRTF of these five headphones, even though from the design they look really similar. And here with the M70, we had the same issue that we had with the Bose QC35 II, which could be a lot of resonance in the ear cup when we remove the pinna. The M50 has the best PRTF of the five with a lot of 10K notch here, but not a lot of activation around four kilohertz. The M40, on the other hand, has a lot of activation and accuracy up to six kilohertz, but no 10 kilohertz notch. The M30 and M20 are less even, less accurate, and they don't have a 10K notch either. Now let's go back in the main room and continue with the dynamic binaural cues. Dynamic binaural cues refer to the ITD and IID effects that are caused by the movement of the head, which the auditory system can use to localize sounds in the median plane. We don't have a test for this quality yet, but more and more gaming and VR headsets are starting to add a head tracking feature to cover for this quality. Distance of the sound source. This is another quality for which we don't have a direct test yet but some of this probably shows up in our PRTF measurements. It is possible to create soundstage using DSP. However, the current consumer implementations don't sound quite natural yet. But a lot of manufacturers are adding such implementations to their headphones, especially the gaming and VR-oriented ones. Our current testing methodology doesn't take DSP into account, but it's definitely on our radar. Localization in enclosed rooms. This explains how the human auditory system is able to localize the source even in enclosed environments. This is achieved by ignoring the reflections in the room and only taking the direct signal into account. This way, the reflected sound doesn't confuse or fool the brain, but they will be considered separately for their spatial cues regarding the size and makeup of the enclosed environment, which is basically the room effects. At this moment, we don't have a test for measuring the room effects of headphones, which have to be created using DSP. However, we do consider the enclosure properties of headphones. For that, we have two tests, openness and acoustic space excitation. These are the inverse of our isolation and leakage scores, respectively. We included them in soundstage since they can affect the soundstage in a subtle but audible way. For example, with very open and leaky headphones, it is possible to detect a change in soundstage as one moves from a large dead room to a small and reflective environment. 
Openness could also be indirectly related to the acoustic impedance of headphones, which we may investigate separately in the future. Now, there is one item left to be discussed in the imaging category, and that's group delay. Group delay is the time it takes for the amplitude of each frequency to reach their maximum. That's why we added this to imaging, since it can add frequency-dependent time distortions to the playback. Group delay differs from phase mismatch by being a monaural quality. That is, it can be perceived even with one ear. But phase mismatch, by definition, is a stereo quality. For our group delay calculations, we have implemented a weighing filter based on the research done on the audibility threshold of group delay at different frequencies in order to make our results more perceptually relevant. So back in the headphone lab, and let's look at some group delay measurement results now. Here on the left, we have the HD800S, and on the right, the Bose Quiet Control 30. The dotted line in both graphs is the audibility threshold for group delay. And as you can see, both of these headphones perform really, really well, and they don't really cross the audibility threshold. So the group delay of both of them should be basically perfect. So now we have two new group delay graphs. On the left, we have the Apple AirPods, and on the right, the Google Pixel Buds. Both of these are open back earbuds, so they don't have a lot of sub bass. But the difference here is that, as you can see, the Pixel Buds has a lot of group delay in the bass range, up to 250 hertz. So in comparison, the base of the AirPods will be perceived to be tighter than the Google Pixel Buds. One last thing is this big jump in group delay around 20 kilohertz, which shouldn't be really audible. But we have noticed that some Bluetooth headphones do this. But at worst, this may sound just like aliasing. So here we have two other headphones that don't do too well with group delay. On the left, we have the Fitbit Flyer, and on the right, the Sennheiser RS195. Both of these headphones have large group delay in the bass range and doesn't make for a great bass. So that's it for our video on headphone soundstage and imaging. As I said in the beginning, this is our first attempt at measuring localization and special qualities of headphones. And there are things still left for us to figure out and implement. Like room effects, CSD, surround capabilities, and head tracking. So let us know if you have any comments or suggestions on how to improve our tests. And if you like this video, subscribe to our channel or become a contributor. Also, we are currently hiring in our offices in Montreal for various positions. So if you want to help people find the best product for their needs, have a look at the careers page on our website. Thank you for watching and see you next time.